Hello, my name is Steve Olson, and I'm a principal field application engineer with BlackBerry QNX. And today I'm going to talk to you about QT and QNX, two queues that belong together. Now, before I get too far into this, I want to remind you to ask your questions. Uh, hopefully I'm available online and can answer them directly, but even if not, I'd like to uh, answer those questions later on. So please send in your questions so that we can do what's necessary to answer them. Now, if you look back in time, back to QT World 2015, I spoke about uh, the art and function of a user interface, and I compared the Nest with the HAL 9000. I'm not going to repeat that talk. I want you to, you can go back and look at it on YouTube and consider it. But uh, it's very interesting when you look at, at what's going on with uh, the user interface itself. Now, today we're going to talk about what makes for a good user experience. And then we're going to delve into the, the actual um, system itself, look at safety and security, tuning of the application in the HMI, as well as the uh, software lifecycle. So without further ado, let's look at a user interface. Now, you think about the cluster in front of a, a, a driver in an automobile, uh, that cluster must be safe. And we can deploy, deploy that with the safety case being using QT Safe Renderer, so you can render in a safe environment, as well as built on uh, the QNX, either the QNX OS for safety or the hypervisor for safety. And we actually have customers that will use the hypervisor, they'll use the common hard hardware platform and run an infotainment system. So playing your music or uh, bringing up uh, maps or something like that, as well as the cluster that needs to remain safe. And we'll even bring something like a map up from the infotainment system and, and push the gauges out of the way and bring it right in front of the the uh, driver, so it enhances the user experience. They're able to see the map right there, and it's still in a safe context because that that is going one way. The other thing to note is the ability to uh, know that things are appearing where they're supposed to on the screen. You see where there's a uh, triangle in the top of that user interface, and it's suggesting that something's wrong. Um, that telltale needs to be there so that you are... are um, enhancing your safety case. You know that it's there and, and we have some methods of being able to do that. So build something with, with a QT uh, safe renderer as well as the QNX OS for safety and you've got a, a combination that works really well. Now, there's a few trends that are going on that uh, I don't like and I've seen it and maybe you've seen it as well. Um, the directed choice dialog box. You see this this dialog here, and you may have seen this exact dialog on on your uh, system as you're as you're doing something online. Um, but is it really enhancing the user experience? Is your device built for your user, or is it built for you? And I like to think of it as uh, if you're purchasing something, it's like the the buy now button is really big and uh, maybe the close or cancel is almost non-existent. Well, that detracts from the user experience. Uh, I want a user to know clearly what my choices are and not be directed so much. It's okay to have different colors or suggestions that are there. But if you can see in this case, close is almost the same color as the background and that detracts from the user experience. You want to have clear delineation. It's, oh, that is a button. It's not just words on a page. And I've seen it to the point where the button outline doesn't even exist. So I, that's that's one of the uh, things that I, I say we should remove from the user experience. The other is we don't want to distract the user with unnecessary motion. And you'll see this some kinds, sometimes you'll see this where the background is moving very slowly. And all of a sudden, your eye is drawn to that instead of what uh, either the presenter that's presenting or uh, the the actual uh, diagrams that you have on the screen. Uh, you're wondering where is that object going? Why is it moving? 
uh, very distracting. So if you can minimize any motion, now it's okay to have motion, but it should be on something like a user interaction. They're in a menu, they push the button and you could scroll the menu to the next selection and, and make it very compelling. So I'd say stick with, stick with those for animations, make them clean, make them well, uh, well understood what's going on and don't have any distracted behaviors going on in the background. Now, let's get into uh, QNX and what it has to offer for safety. Uh, this slide is talking about our safety pedigree, how, how much we've been involved with it. And we're not going to go through it in detail. But if you go back to 2010, uh, that's on the left-hand side there, you can see that uh, we took the QNX safe kernel and a few components through. And the certification is the, the bottom set there. It says IEC 61508, so the industrial standard. Uh, we did just a few things in services. Those are the circles above. Now, look all the way to the right, and you can see that today we're taking not just the OS for safety through, but the hypervisor. There's a lot more components that are going through. And uh, if you look at the certifications on the bottom, we're doing a lot more certification. So it's not just industrial, it's medical, it's train, and it's automotive. So you're getting a lot of different uh, pieces coming through. So, and as well, our, our ability to work with our customers in a, in a consulting environment, we've increased that as well. So you get a, a compelling story when we look at how much we really are investing in safety and continuing to invest and looking at how do we do it as efficiently as we can and then take our customers alongside. Uh, one of the key features of any real-time operating system is a preemptive scheduler. And you may have seen it before and you're like, okay, I get that. That's, that's how you build systems today. But I'm going to talk about a feature that's unique to QNX and it's the adaptive partitioning. And in order to illustrate that, I am going to talk about this for just a moment. This example, we have three processes on the left-hand side. They have high, medium, and low priorities, very simple but uh, it takes the, the highest priority thread in the system and it'll run it to completion. And if there's several at the same priority, it will round robin schedule those in order to get the job done. And then once they're all blocked or complete, then it'll go to the lower priority and lower priority. And it works well when you have three sets of processes and there's, there's 10 or so tasks that are running. But now when I have 50 or 60 processes running and each of those is scheduling multiple threads, it's very hard to load balance and to make sure that you close timing on them all. That's where we have our adaptive partitioning. And in this example, and again, it's a simple example, we have three time partitions or temporal partitions. The, uh, the first is IO and then critical. And finally, the human machine interface. And below it, you'll see that there's a budget associated with each time partition. So 30% of the CPU can be spent in the IO partition, 40% in the critical partition where you're actually activating things and, and listening to the real-time nature of the, the machine, and then 30% left over for the human machine interface. This is just an example. But uh, in the previous example, if we had 40 or 50 different processes and somebody noticed that the mouse was lagging a little bit, they might say, well, let me just bump the priority of it. And all of a sudden, the lathe control jitters. Well, that's something that if that's critical to your application, you just can't have. You don't want the jitter in the mouse, but you, you can't tolerate the jitter in the lathe control. And we've all seen where mouses can get jittery, where they're not quite keeping up with the, the, um, the user interface, and it degrades the user experience. Well, by allowing you to set aside a certain CPU budget for a set of processes, and then it's a smaller set. So we're not balancing 60 with more than 100 threads. You're now balancing 10 or 20. And uh, the, the idea is, is that you can create as many of these partitions, time partitions as you need in order to schedule it. The adaptive nature allows you to take that um, any unused cycle. So if I'm not using the HMI, those cycles can be used by the other partitions. Um, or the critical partition, nothing's going on, then I can use it over there. So it's not like I lose those cycles, but I, I guarantee that, uh, that 
the CPU budget will be used by the processes until they've exhausted them all. And then it falls back to your standard preemptive uh, scheduler that you have. So that's what we have. A few things that we've talked about from a safety perspective. What about security? We like to call this the onion slide. And uh, you can see at its core uh, down at the bottom. So I'll read from bottom to top and we'll go through all of it. But uh, you have the ability to uh, put a key into the hardware at manufacturing. And you say, well, why do that? Well, that way you know that this device is authentic. And once I can, can show that it's authentic, I can establish a root of trust and everything that runs on the machine can be signed and encrypted so that uh, nobody else can read it. Uh, and then it's provisioned into the system and deployed at runtime. Uh, th that's a very powerful story, and it, it helps with the software update that we'll talk about in a minute. But the other thing is when, when you look at the user persona, who's using your device, uh, as uh, think, think about an infusion pump where we have a nurse or doctor and they're working with this device, they need to see patient data. You know, what is the prescription that they are supposed to uh, provide through, uh, through the system? What's the dosage? <clears throat> and how do they need to set up the machine? And they can, they can scan the, uh, the wristband and make sure that the patient is the right patient and, and they're using it and they can see that data. But if somebody else were to come in, say the technician, they can't look up patient data. That's, that's prohibited from HIPAA, the, the privacy laws. But uh, the, the technician comes in and they want to maybe see a, a, a patient, a mock-up, a John Doe, if you will, that would use the system. Well, they can uh, bring that up and maybe bring it into modes that might kill the patient, something that a doctor or a nurse should never be able to do. So using the user persona as you're interacting with the device to minimize any any cross use between the two is going to enhance the user experience. Now, one of the things I talked about earlier uh, was what happens when you run out of time. But how do you know you're close to running out of time? And you need the ability to tune the system. You can see in, in this one, in, in the middle, the CPU activity, uh, there's a couple of CPUs that are being tracked. And we can see that uh, the green one there is over 90% utilized. I would say that that is uh, concerning. Why is it there? How come it's so high? How come we don't have a little bit more headroom on the machine itself? Uh, and looking to the right, just one set, you see that uh, it's not per CPU now, but now it's per process. We can see how much time each process is being allocated. Kind of gives you an idea of where you could look if you needed to save a few clock cycles in order to bring that timing down and, and meet the uh, headroom requirements that you may have on your device. Uh, all the way to the right, and, and I'm not going to zoom in here, uh, but uh, suffice it to say that you can zoom in all the way to the, to the point of seeing what uh, threads are blocked on what events and uh, what wakes them up, how messages within the process or within the machine get passed around. So if there's any bottlenecks going on, you can use it. It's a very powerful tool. Uh, you can even send those files to other people and they can look at them without having your software build. So if you have an expert in a certain area, uh, maybe they can assist in, in looking at what's going on. That gives you that ability. The next is looking at the life cycle. And you want to be able to take the device, authenticate it, it can authenticate the cloud. The cloud can authenticate it. And once you get that communication going, you're able to uh, establish a new software load and bring it down onto the system. Well, talked about a lot of things today, but make sure that you understand that the system is safe, secure, reliable, tunable, and maintainable, all while providing a compelling user experience that's safe, embeddable, and upgradable. Thank you.